you all on a tour of New Mexico. So the book that I that came out this April, The Best Wildflower Hikes in New Mexico, this covers, um, there's 42 trails from all across the state. And I actually hiked maybe about 65 trails. They didn't all make it in this edition. Hopefully there'll be a second one with more. Um, and I tried to get a really great uh, or spread out geographic diversity around the state of the different wildflower hikes. Although there is a concentration in the Rocky Mountains. So Colorado border down to Santa Fe over to the Jemez has the most abundant and reliable wildflowers from year to year. So there are uh, a good chunk of hikes in that area, but I've also done hikes in the southern part and the southwestern and the northwestern and tried to get a good representation from all over New Mexico's wildflowers. Um, so like Jan said, I am a conservation photographer. My background is in ecology. I spent years as an environmental educator, um, went overseas to the Peace Corps and worked in sustainable development in Panama for three years and came back and um, started an organization here called Earth Care, which did environmental education with youth. And now they're, I'm not there anymore. I left, let's see, my youngest son is seven. So I left seven years ago. Um, they're very involved in a lot of the climate action going on in the state. And I became a freelance science writer and photographer. And so I love to tell stories about conservation, about um, you know stories that engage people in the natural world and the beauty of it. And all with the desire to have people take action and, and preserve um, these beautiful places that we have. So I've worked throughout the Americas um, in Brazil, but really New Mexico is my, my home, my backyard, and I love to explore this state and hope to share some of that enthusiasm for this place with you guys tonight. Um, so I'm gonna share different hikes and I'll mention kind of their links. And, and some of the flowers that you'll find in those areas, some of my favorites, a good times of year to go there. Um, and then we'll hit the Alpine area and some hikes around Taos. So feel free to share your knowledge with me of hikes that you love during that time or, or after the PowerPoint presentation. And, um, and yeah, I'd love for this to be kind of a, a give and take kind of experience as well. So let me pull this up. Can you, are you seeing slides now? Yes. Okay, great. There might be a little delay in the movement of the slides. Sometimes that happens, but um, I'll give a little pause. So this is really about wildflower adventures in a changing world. I'm also going to be talking in, in some of these areas about some of the change that I was seeing over the two years that I was writing this book. And then, you know, I've been in New Mexico for 16 years, hiking across the state um, and talking about some of the impacts that climate change is having and some of the people working on solutions for that but mostly about the beauty and the wildflowers. So I'm gonna, this is the 42 hikes that I put in the book around New Mexico. So you can see the cluster in the, in the Northern mountains. And there are several also in the South, a couple in the East, a couple in the Northwest. I would love to have included more in the Northwest. It's just the flower blooms there are so unreliable as I experienced, I'll talk about later. You know, last year I went out to the Badlands and the wildflowers were incredible. They had a good amount of spring rain. This year I went out and there was very little out there. So um, I also want to just start by saying uh, the book, the hiking descriptions have plant common names. I didn't use the scientific names. Um, I'm a, I did take botany in college 20 years ago and science, I have a hard time getting the scientific names to stick. Uh, those ones that are pretty common to me, I remember, but I really wanted this book to be accessible to the general public. So I use common names and in the back, there's a chart that has common names with their scientific name in case anybody, you know, cause common names vary from 
Santa Fe to Taos sometimes, even that distance, people call things differently. Um, so you can, I know it's important, especially if you're traveling internationally that you know what flower you're talking about and using the scientific names can allow us to do that. So there is a chart in the back of the book for that. Um, and I just want to start with the Pasque flower, which I know blooms in the areas around Taos. This one is in the Jemez Mountains. But this flower kind of signals to me that the wildflower season has started. It pushes up through ground that is wet from, still from snowmelt. It grows in, uh, you can see here, Ponderosa Forest in decent altitudes. Um, it's really beautiful. Those white cups on the inside actually form this little microclimate that warms the inside of the flower just enough to entice pollinators and to keep them there and keep them pollinating. Um, and it's a lovely, it's one of the first to bloom in this northern area along with Easter daisies. And it's kind of the harbinger of spring. It blooms right around Easter. And in some areas, you can see these blooming by the hundreds. So I always go back to the same trails. I know I kind of know where they're located and where I've seen them in the past and start looking for them at the end of March. Um, and uh, one of New Mexico's botanists was Robert DeWitt Ivy. And I love this quote by him. He says, our lives attain a new level of enrichment when we gain the ability to recognize as friends, the plants and animals of our own environment. We can go through the seasons expecting encounters with them at times and places magically predestined. They greet us on every hand and add dimension of meaning and belonging to every outdoor experience. And I wholeheartedly agree that he wrote at the beginning of his, um, well, his botanical illustrated volume, which is a beautiful book. And I think a lot of botanists and plant enthusiasts use that in New Mexico. And it was kind of the inspiration for me to want to do this book, to really open the world of plants to a bigger audience, uh, hikers and anyone on the trails to give them that added connection to nature when they're out there. So the first place I wanna take you is the Sky Islands in southeastern and eastern New Mexico. And these actually are um, the first, what, what I think of as the first to bloom kind of in mass in New Mexico. And the Oregon Mountain Desert Peaks, I love to head there in mid-March to see this, to see the Mexican poppy bloom. It is absolutely stunning, super easy to get to. It's in the Oregon Mountain National Monument. This is on the east side of the, of the mountains and you can see the needles in the back, sugar loaf on the left hand side. And um, the poppies close up at night. So this is taken under a full moon on the spring equinox two years ago when I was up there with my family. There's a campground up in the, the Ponderosa Pines in the mountains there. Um, and I highly recommend going down to see them. I know that they've been getting a lot more visitors and people kind of wandering out in the fields and trampling poppies and are trying to control the selfie Instagram crowd so they don't step on the flowers. Um, there are trails that go through the National Monument. You can follow and see the spectacular bloom. And there are roads that you can drive along and just see them right off the side of the road. And interestingly, in, in the Oregon Mountains, um, there are white poppies. There's the albino poppies there as well, and they grow along the road to this campground. And they, you probably all are familiar with this term, but the Sky Islands means these tall mountains surrounded by desert. And so they're isolated from other mountain ranges, and they have often endemic and really unique wildflower species, sometimes wildlife. Um, and the Oregon Mountains is one of those places. It's really fun and interesting botanically to go and visit and learn about the, the wildflowers there. So this is a great spot to start your wildflower season. If you want to travel, go down south. It's still not too hot there. Um, and you get these beautiful landscapes along the trails. And the claret cup cactus start blooming against this incredible rugged mountain backdrop in early April. <clears throat> and some of these claret cups are so old and, and established. There's, you know, dozens of blooms on them. Then you get these tall blue sky scorpion weed that uh, the year I was there, they were just kind of blanketing certain areas on the western side of the mountains, 
these beautiful colors at sunset. You get the desert onions, which are very fragrant and have the onion bulbs underground. Um, their flowers are bigger than what we have in the north here, the nodding onion and the, uh, the purple onion, not remember the names, first the G, but they are um, another beautiful desert onion. Then you have the uh, two kinds, at least, of evening primroses that open late in the afternoon and close again in the heat of the day. Um, and some of them only bloom for one day. One interesting thing I learned, you guys might have read the, the study from a group of scientists in Tel Aviv, um, University of the Tel Aviv. They discovered that desert evening primroses, they have a yellow type they were studying, can actually hear. So that means that those petals can sense oncoming vibration of pollinators wings and they will release nectar when they hear when they feel that vibration so they store their nectar and then release it knowing that one bee follows another and they get ready for those pollinators um, by releasing more nectar and sweetness just when the flower needs it and the pollinator is coming by i thought that was really cool so it's like the desert is listening to us when we're out there in the silence um, this flower is called the Oregon Mountain Larkspur in the Oregon Mountains. Up north, more people call it the Wooten's Larkspur, Delphinium Wootenii, but it's the only pink, fuzzy, beautiful Larkspur that I know of. It tends to be a lot shorter than some of the Alpine Larkspurs, the Montane Larkspurs, but it grows, it also grows along with the poppies and the primroses and the sort of mix in the bajadas and the desert floor there. There's scarlet hedge nettle, which grows in the watery canyons of the Oregon Mountains. Um, uh, you saw in that first picture of the poppies that the Oregon Mountains do get snow, and that snow, you know, melts fairly quickly, but it does create these spring, these uh, water in the canyons, and then there are some springs that last throughout the summer. And as the season progresses in the Oregon Mountains and it gets hotter, the flowers in the desert floor go away and the only ones left are in the canyons. And this is one of those bright red stands out. Another one is the Oregon Mountain Evening Primrose, which is endemic to the Oregon Mountains, only found in these watery canyons, and it blooms in July. It looks a bit like Hooker's Evening Primrose, um, tall and yellow and multi-blooms on one stalk here in the north, but you won't find Hooker's down there. You only find this Oregon Mountain Evening Primrose. That's a fun one to go see if you can take the heat in the middle of the summer there. So the Sacramento Mountains are also um, Sky Mountains, Sky Islands, sorry. And there are, I believe, 13 endemic species to these mountains. Also really unique flora, lots of butterflies to explore here. Decent amount of wildlife I've seen while I was there. And they have these beautiful Milky Way picturesque skies. This is the Manjo Lookout, which is near the trailhead of two of the hikes in the book. Um, the White Mountain Wilderness, the crest trail that goes through there has 21 miles of trail where you're walking above tree line that dips down into montane forest and just these incredible views on both sides. To, and you can drive right up to the heights if you need an easy hike or you can walk up these lush canyons into the onto the crest trail. And several of those options are in the book, but I was really uh, I hadn't done much exploration in the Sacramento Mountains before this book, so this gave me opportunity to really get to know them and, and fall in love with another place. So this is at the top of the Crest Trail. Um, you can see a, a red-tailed hawk, I think, over across the valley there on top, treetop by me. But that's kind of what the mountains look like from above. Um, they have lots of Rocky Mountain iris, as we do in their early summer, late spring. So one of the endemic species is the Sacramento Mountains paintbrush, Castellasia wootenai. They also have Castellasia miniata, but they don't, wait, is it miniata or a different one? Anyway, there's two types of red uh, paintbrush in these mountains, um, but most of them that you'll see are the Sacramento Mountains paintbrush, which only grow there. They have New Mexico Penstemon, which is endemic, although it's locally really abundant. 
and beautiful. Um, and the Sierra Blanca lupin, which is, grows at tall heights. This is right in front of Sierra Blanca Peak, which is on the Mescalero Apache Reservation. It's a sacred mountain and hikers aren't allowed up to that peak, but you can get to this one I'm standing on, on the gondola um, or the gondola, which is uh, a fun ride up to the top and you get to Lookout Mountain. And this is, this Lookout Mountain Peak and Sierra Blanca Peak are, I believe the only mountains in Southern New Mexico that have alpine tundra and they are above tree line. So there's a whole bunch of really fun alpine tundra flowers the Rusby's Primrose, very short dwarfed version of the Mountain Death Camas growing at the top. Um, and it's really fun to just explore right around the outlook that they have. And that's an easy, easy hike to get to. And then you can also from there go as far as you want along the Crest Trail, back down to the parking area or just take the gondola down. Then moving northeast are the Southern Great Plains. Um, and this is a really fun area to go to in early summer in the grasslands and the prairies. There's a lot of private land out there. It's a little bit hard to find public land to, to go hiking and trail walking. This picture is near Wagon Mound. There is a, wild, um, a wildlife refuge or two right in that area. The wildlife refuges are nice to go to. Um, but there's also Santa Rosa, State Park, Santa Rosa Lake State Park, and they have a really nice trail called the Shoreline Trail. It's just a couple miles and has a really nice variety of Great Plains flowers, Southern Great Plains flowers, which you won't see anywhere else. So you'll look at these and find some of these familiar to our lowlands, but there are some unique species to that area as well. So lots of blanket flower, like lots of blanket flower, lots of Dakota Mock Vervain, Lots of um, the stem for Nerb Daisy and growing mixed in the purple and the yellow. It's really beautiful among the Choya. These Chinese lanterns, which I thought were so cool, these star-shaped patterns on them. Um, the prairie burr look like peacocks to me. And just a smattering of various different things. The Great Plains paintbrush. Um, this one that looks like a uh, pumpkin color, the two leaves senna. And then, you know, with smattering of cactus, the prickly pear cactus, I don't think I have a picture here, but they are huge and the blooms are amazing on them surrounding that lake in the limestone, uh, water, you know, limestone rocks that butt up right against the lake. They're really impressive to go see. More penstemon from the Kiowa grasslands area. That's another fun area. There's not really great trails there, uh, like marked trails, but you can go to the Kiowa grasslands and just kind of wander through the some of the areas and find really beautiful wildflowers. And there's lots of prairie dogs out there. Here they are sitting in a globe mallow field. This is a place I found um, just driving around in the area. And there was this huge prairie dog town uh, behind an electric fence for some reason on private property, but I just kind of sat on the side of the road and watched them for a good while among these wildflowers, really fun. So I, love, I just included some quotes here that inspired me while I was writing this book. Um, I have no words in which to conjure up in your mind the lilting, lisping song of the black-throated blue warbler, nor which to give you even a taste of the vibrant, energetic refrain of the winter wren, these sounds come from another world that must be experienced to be felt. This is from writer and biologist Bernard Heinrich. And um, the birding out in northeastern New Mexico, along with the wildflowering, is really fun. This is mostly taken, these photos, in Mills Canyon, which is a canyon along the Canadian River in the grasslands. So they got bullocks, orioles, they got, oh, I always get this one wrong. It's not, I think it's indigo bunting, the blue one, the killdeer doing its alarm display to uh, distract from its nest. Um, I saw scarlet tanagers out there, whole bunch of stuff. So fall and spring are a really good time to go birding in that area. 
And then there's this surprising gem that I'd never been to before, the Sugar Eat Canyon State Park right outside of Raton. Um, it's, it's a pretty small state park and it butts right against the border of Colorado. Part of, part of the park is a wildlife refuge on the other side, uh, Colorado Wildlife Refuge. And this park in July was surprisingly flowery and had also some interesting flowers I didn't see anywhere else. So that's Chamisa. There was a wildfire that swept through the park in 2011 and took out, unfortunately, most of the ponderosas, a lot of the oak, but a lot of it is coming back in the understory. But it did open up, as wildfires do, a good amount of space for wildflowers to start coming in and growing. And there were some, some just abundant meadows covered in wildflowers out there. A great place to watch thunderstorms blow through. Um, so this is the canyon looking back southeast, and you can see the different volcanic cones in the distance. And at the end of this canyon, kind of behind me is Lake Maloya, which is a reservoir, and Lake Alice are in this area, and those both have trails you can walk around and see the flowers along the lakes. Um, I'm here up on top of Little Horse Mesa, which is a high mesa meadow. Uh, Ponderosa Park really they're dotted with ponderosas on top and has incredible wildflowers mixed in in the grasslands on top things like sego lilies, uh, black-eyed susans are abundant, burnt orange dandelion, monument plant in end of May and June along the hills in the park you can just drive through and monument plant and Rocky Mountain iris are just going bazonkers in this park really beautiful great place to see them if you don't have other spots that you love. Um, the year I was there, they were just blooming in mass, these big towering monument plants. And then uh, they have leather flower, which maybe you folks up in Taos have seen more of. I really haven't seen it around Santa Fe. That's the only place I've actually found it in New Mexico, much more common in Colorado and North. Um, but it's pretty abundant in the park in, Santa, in Sugar Eat park and then the dotted gay feather which I've seen there I've also seen it in the Hamas and not many other places and then there's these huge fields of cut leaf cone flower which I know are you know pretty common in the mountains but they're mixed in with this purple joe spotted pieweed spotted joe pieweed and um, birds and deer and black bear I even had a mountain lion cross my path um, and foxes and the wildlife are just turkey, uh, you know, all kinds of scat and signals that they're around. There's a big bear claw, probably a coyote or a fox, um, deer passing through these wildflower meadows. So just, you know, highly recommend taking June and July trip in that time frame and going there. Uh, another spot that I, Love to check out, as you're talking with Jan at the beginning, are the Badlands. Um, there are, you know, so many Badlands in Northwest New Mexico. I've slowly been discovering their wildflower characteristics. One that I really love to go to is, is heavily impacted by oil and gas development, the Lybrook Badlands and the, I'm sorry, Apache, uh, Apache Peak. I don't know why I'm blanking on the name. It'll come to me. But right south of Farmington in, in Navajo country. The, the good thing about, if you can say that, oil and gas development is there's lots of roads and you can drive in, <coughs> excuse me, and do pretty cool wildflowering. But there are, you know, lots of geologic formations to see. And in April, May, possibly into early June is the best time to go there. This is a place I went with my kids in the winter and I've been back since called Hoodooville. And um, you can drive within a half a mile of it. Um, there's some interesting ponderosas and other tree growth. Not a lot of wildfires on this road, but one road closer to the highway. Um, there is an incredible path and if anybody wants to know what it is I'll have to give you directions because the roads aren't well labeled and they make new ones all the time so it's a little confusing but there are sega lilies growing in in you know harsh conditions 
there are, I'm pretty sure about this identification, I'm not totally 100%, but thrift mock goldenweed, a stenotis, could be a different stenotis, not sure yet. Um, but just like growing in this really harsh country, pretty sure this is king's lupin, um, could be short stemmed, it could be a mixture of the two, some western wildflower and tall mustards. And these were super impressive. I kind of drove all the way to the end of a road and there was this really cool canyon with huge rock formations around. And last year, not this year, but the year before, the these like sandy mounds were just covered in lupin, like acres of it, acres and acres of it. Just really impressive to see how these wildflowers thrive. And then um, clustered broom rape, which is obligate with big, big sagebrush, which is growing under there. It's parasitic on that. That's why it doesn't have any green color to it. Um, not sure what that origeron is or super hard to identify. You guys probably know. And the snowball sand verbena, which is super fragrant, kind of smells like jasmine to me. Um, that's pretty common actually here in my backyard, but it's out there as well. And these soils out there are, you know, highly erodible on their own and with any disturbance they erode even more and soils wash into the San Juan River that impacts endangered fish that impacts raptor populations that eat them um, it's all connected and so in these areas it's is where these plants are growing it's really important to keep them in the ground keep the soil intact keep them there so that you know just I mean that's a beautiful place it's super incredible and the Night skies there are amazing. Unfortunately, there's kind of going gangbusters again with new hydraulic fracking measures that allow them to open up areas that they weren't able to open up before for oil and gas development. And this is an evening primrose. This is another uh, penstemon. Uh, and this is the endangered clover's cactus that the article in the New Mexico Magazine was partially about. about um, and there are efforts to limit oil and gas development in the area. Uh, as you probably know, rare and endangered plants, even if they're listed federally, are not uh, protected except in terms of collection. So oil, you know, developers who want to go and disturb the land there can come up with a plan to either transplant them or just plow them under and the BLM has the right to approve any of those plans as they see fit. So this is on BLM land. So the clover's cactus is pretty impacted by the development and you can see there, you know, they have been growing right at the edges of, of some of the development. They've been moved quite a bit into canyons, uh, but the fragmentation, you know, does not really helping their survival. Here are some articles and resources if you want to get more into helping with the efforts to to protect the Badlands. The Greater Chaco, the Greater Chaco area, um, they're trying to protect a 10 mile radius around Greater Chaco, which does not include Lybrook and Angel Peak. There's the name, Angel Peak scenic area in the Badlands below there, um, where Clover's cactus and this Aztec hylia grow that are <laughs> state endangered listed BLM sensitive plants. So there are some efforts to try to help out those plants if there's some resources there. And then we move into back over a little more central and northern to the Alpine area, which are just absolutely fabulous. And um, here's kind of early plant in the Alpine area, the golden pea. Uh, it <clears throat> grows by rhizomes, so it can spread pretty significantly in big patches. This is at the trailhead to Serpent Lake and Hickorita Peak, which is a really gorgeous alpine hike near Sipapu. There's a forest road off of that main road that goes to Sipapu Ski Area. Um, and right around the trailhead is great wildflowering. The first mile or two are pretty casual, easy, and then it gets steep to the lake after that. It's three and a half miles to the lake and, and five miles to Hickory to Peak. Um, 
but I've done that hike three times and have been, you know, amazed at the wildflowers every time. So the great thing about alpine hikes is you get this change in life zones, starting, you know, some, some hikes you start in the foothills and go all the way to the alpine tundra. A lot of the hikes start in the montane area. These are some of the early summer wildflowers in the montane area. And um, the Canadian violets often come back for a second bloom in late summer, even early fall. But these like to grow together in really moist forests. And, you know, it's sort of like this really common floral community that you'll see in our mountains throughout the Southern Rockies here. Western red columbine, which is a beautiful one. And then you get to these high, dry mountain meadows. So you have things like um, the scarlet penstemon, the yarrow, which is a medicinal plant. The, uh, there's different kinds of sinkfoil, sinkfoil mixed in there, harebells, um, some ragweed sage. And so it smells really beautiful. And there's a really good diversity. This is on uh, Jack's Creek in the Pecos wilderness where there are, that trail leads to several other, you know, destinations, trails in the book, to lakes, to you know, high mountain meadows, to really beautiful places. It's a, it's a track though, it's a track to get up to Jack's Creek for sure. Um, the, then there are the high wet meadows, the wetlands, often surrounding alpine lakes, also along creeks, you know, you'll see these um, getting up around 10,000 feet often. And here you have elephant's head. And I love what Al Schneider, the guy, the botanist who runs Southwest Colorado Wildflowers, a resource that I like to use a lot. He said, you never forget a pink elephant. And that's certainly true for me. This is one of the first flowers that really like struck my fancy and started me on this obsession for wildflowers. Um, but they really do look like little elephants with trunks and wings and the big round head on the top. Um, and then other sort of wet mountain meadow plants, there are some sinkafoil in there, there's marsh uh, marigold, there's shooting stars, there's fringed and star gentian, there's uh, a lot often along the edges of these wet areas or in them you get corn lilies and on the edges you get the you can see the shrub sinkafoil on the back. It's a little little higher mound. Um, Jacob's ladder. Um, so the the meadow up in in your area at the end of the Bull of the Woods Trail is has a lot of these same species. Um, it's a really nice example and not super hard to get to. About three miles in. Um, but these mountain meadows are super important. They, I was talking to Rachel Kahn, who is the program director at Amigos Bravos up in Taos, um, and they have a big program on the wetland gems, wetland jewels, I think, that they've been running for several years to try to preserve some of these high mountain meadows uh, and restore some. And you know, she talks about them as the sponges of our watershed, and they hold water, they hold snow melt and release it slowly over time. And they're super important to those areas. So I'm going to go through a few other alpine hikes um, fairly quickly here. Some of my favorites in the Sangres and up in the, in the Taos area. So this is at the top, the summit of Penitente Peak, right outside of Santa Fe here. And there are the Pecos Mountains in the background. Santa Fe Baldi is the one right off to the left there. Um, but there are, there are three peaks along a hike, Deception Peak, Lake Peak, and Penitente Peak. And in early to mid-July, the alpine flowers are just, you know, like this, just covering the grounds. I was actually most impressed. Penitente Peak is kind of this round, big, long meadow, more so than Lake Peak, which is pretty jagged. Um, and it, it just has so many varieties, you know, alpine clover, of course, you can see all the purple in there, just super abundant, but a whole variety of alpine wildflowers. Uh, there is a bluebell called the celestial bluebells, which Patrick Alexander, I think, named, which is endemic just to the Sangre de Cristos. And it's a small, low growing that you can find up at, at 
in these mountains here. Um, and Patrick Alexander is a botanist with the BLM, if you don't know him, he's a great resource. Then there's Heart Lake up in the Latir Peaks Wilderness. It's about five miles in, uh, you, know, you know, it's up by Cuesta, you drive up to Cabresto Reservoir, and you can, you know, the trail is, is fairly easy going for most of it. It's up the last mile or two to get to the lake. It gets kind of steep, but it has great wildflowering. Highly recommend. You need a four by four to get up to Cabresto Lake most of the year. Um, but they're, you know, just like these two streams. I think that's Cabresto Creek and Bull Creek coming together. And I actually took a wrong turn. I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, on this trail and I ended up, you know, you're supposed to at some point take a left onto Lake Fork Creek, Lake Fork Trail. And I went straight for some reason. I was actually looking at a uh, Calypso orchid distracted me and ended up taking a five mile detour. But the canyon at the end of Bull Creek Trail is really full of wildflowers too. There's no water, no lake up there but there were alp lilies and these uh, Ross's, um, Ross's avens and all kinds of small, really cool wildflowers. Um, but Heart Lake is a beautiful place, even you know, popular with backpackers, but not too crowded. This down here on the right is um, Fendler's Meadow Ruin Bloom, which is kind of a fun plant. And then Heart, heart Leaf, what is it called? Heartleaf bitter, bitter crests all along, you know, just like clustered all along the creeks in this area. Um, Columbine Canyon is abundant in columbines, as you guessed from its name, blue columbines, really abundant on the sort of the mid part of this trail. Um, so fun to get to. It's also uh, near Cuesta. There's a campground right there and a trailhead. Uh, I think you guys actually, you know, the Taos group took a field trip to this canyon um, last year, Jan told me, but it, it, it was really beautiful. And the last two miles, which are unfortunately the like steepest um, and most tiring, have these just cascade after cascade. You know, this this picture of the river here is in the lower portion, but it just gets steep and cascades. and just lush with wildflowers you know the canyon gets narrow and you know you know you can barely get through the trail with wildflowers up to your waist and higher in some areas and then you get up to a meadow underlooking Lobo Peak and if you go over you can actually climb to the top of Lobo Peak and go down any of those canyons Italianos, Manzano, Manz what is it called? Manzanita, Yerba Canyon from there if you want if you want to do that whole hike but the hike uh, is eight miles round trip just up to this meadow um, but there's lots of wildflowers in the first few miles if you just want to do a few miles there's a big beaver pond right at the beginning um, yeah there's lots of larkspur there's the Sapello canyon larkspur which is an endemic is endemic or just rare i think it's rare found quite a bit, I guess, in the, Sa in the Sandia Mountains, but not so much anywhere else, but they're in this canyon as well. The Agua Sarca Trail, I think some of you are familiar with this, up, up also off of that road to Sipapu, but the violets were the highlight of this hike for me. So near the top, you have these yellow violets, the Nuttall's, uh, the Nuttall's violets, and then the Western dog violets and the Canadian violets, but they are really, really abundant, at least the year that I was last year when I was there on this hike. Um, and you can either hike from the bottom to the top or you can drive up the forest road and, you know, the, the yellow violets are pretty close to the top of the top of the trail near the forest road. So that was fun. There's a lot of uh, pussy toes, kitten tails. Um, a lot of fun plants along this trail. A monument plant in the meadow right at the bottom. There's also um, anemone, which I haven't seen really. I haven't, I don't think I've seen it anywhere else except this trail. Might be more popular up in those mountains, but. So that's a fun bot 
trail to botanize. And then there are uh, some individual flowers to watch out for in your area, in my area. Um, I love this quote by Ralph Walter Emerson. Flowers are a proud assertion that a ray of beauty outvalues all the utilities in the world. And you know, here's a great example of that, the fairy slippers, which are, I found um, dozens growing in areas in the Sangre de, in here uh, in, the San, in the Santa Fe National Forest. Um, and I found scatterings up in the Latir Peaks. You've probably seen them in the Taos Mountains somewhere. Uh, they are a rare orchid on the in state endangered list. This one is a coral root. This is the spotted coral root, which um, grows often under spruce trees and attaches to its roots. It's also parasitic. The one on the right is pine sap. But these are super abundant along the Heart Lake Trail, which is really fun. Just like, you know, these big clusters, many of them along the trail in the spruce forest there. Uh, these are fun. I love their colors. There's the Perry's Primrose, which is an alpine, pretty large plant, really beautiful color along water. Um, and then, you know, in, in the Sangre de Cristos here and up in Taos, I, I find these like aspen glades. It's sort of like you're walking through a meadow, then an aspen glade, then a conifer forest, and then it repeats. And each one is dominated by a different wildflower. So this is the Dock Wheeler Trail, which is a, not a very, uh, it's a lightly used trail in the, in the Pecos. And one field was just full of this orange sneezeweed. Another field was the giant lousewort. Another field was um, monkshood and cow parsnip and then bracken fern. So it's really, and then the Pecos mariposa lily, which is a rare plant is in this area. And it's just fun to like see which plants are dominating and I'll be interested to go back and see if it changes year to year. Um, and kind of try to figure out what, why that is. And then you get to the high alpine and you get things like Rocky Mountain Buttercup, all these little low growing plants that are trying to stay out of the wind and out of the icy blowing cold water up at the top, um, have a very short growing season, but, but really bloom, bloom, bloom profusely. The gentians are one of my favorite flower groups. I don't know if it's a family or a genus, but Anyway, they're all, they all kind of bloom at the late summer, and they have these colors that you don't often see in flowers, this purple that is in this one tending more towards the blue, really beautiful, like the fringe gentian, the star gentian, these arctic gentian are, are alpine tundra flowers, and that's Hickory the Peak behind them. Um, a few things I want to say about the mountains. Uh, I've been talking with a scientist out of Fort Lewis College who, who was part of the group that wrote the latest International Panel on Climate Change chapter on mountains. Um, and, you know, really looking at how or the fact that our mountain ecosystems are really changing fast. They're, you know, they're susceptible to temperature increases. They're warming quite fast due to climate change all across the globe. That's true in the mountains. And so it's changing some things about the mountains. Um, we have less snow and we have an earlier snow melt. So that snow is the pivot around which everything functions in a mountain ecosystem. The plants, the animals, you know, the landscape, the water, and uh, that is dramatically shifting. Um, so we're gonna have to start to look at how we're managing our water supply with that shift. And then what's interesting too, is she told me that this, there's this rule, and I'm not gonna remember the original name of it, where it came from, but you probably all are familiar with it. If you go up in altitude, you gain, bloom times. So say the Rocky Mountain iris that bloom at lower elevations in, in May. Um, if you go up a thousand feet, you'll see them blooming there 30 days later is usually the, the window that it changes. A thousand feet equals plus 30 days. So 
that rule is beginning to shift quite a bit. She's doing studies out of the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory in, in Gothic, New Mexico, which is basically in Crested Butte. I highly recommend following their work if you're interested in plants and alpine areas and uh, what's, what's happening if you don't already. Um, but yeah, that time period is, is shortening quite a bit. So she's saying that, you know, wildflower people who are organizing wildflower festivals will have to be flexible and change the dates to hit the bloom at the right time. Those of us who like to head into the mountains to catch certain flowers are going to have to shift the times that we might go looking for them. Um, and then there are some interesting things happening between flowers and their pollinators, where flowers, because the snow is melting earlier, they're blooming earlier, but some pollinators aren't using the same environmental cues, so they're still sleeping while the flowers that they would normally pollinate are out, and they're not, these flowers are not getting pollinated. Um, there's a few studies that are showing that. Uh, so things are sort of missed, mismatched phenologically out there at the moment. And then there's these cute little guys, these lagomorphs. I called them a rodent last time I gave this presentation. They're not rodents, they are lagomorphs. Um, pikas. And they live at high altitudes, often above tree line. They, like me, are obsessed with wildflowers and you know, I collect them with my camera and my pen, and they collect them, you know, to feed off of them all throughout the winter, but they're super sensitive to temperature changes. And so pika are, you know, they don't have anywhere to go. They can't, they're too small to climb down a mountain and find a higher mountain range. So biologists are talking about doing something called assisted migration, moving pika that are already adapted to higher temperatures, say in Utah, up to mountains that are now warming or moving like our pika up to a higher altitude where things are still cooler. Um, there's a biologist, kind of the small mammal guru of New Mexico out of uh, the University of Socorro, Dr. Fry. And last time I got her a hold of her, she said they, hadn't noticed a decline in our pika populations in our mountains. So ours seem to be holding on, but it's something to watch out for. There's one collecting his wildflowers. Um, so one organization to keep an eye on, I already mentioned before, is the Amigos Bravos because of the restoration they're doing in uh, high headland wetlands, super important. They're doing a lot of work around, around the Taos area. Um, and then this woman, the scientist Heidi Steltzer said, no, but no matter what, the mountains will still be beautiful, no matter what changes. You know, things are gonna shift, things are gonna change with climate change, and there will still be wildfires, there will still be beauty, there'll still be places that we wanna go to um, and spend our summers in. Here's some tips if you're hiking in alpine areas just to preserve these plants in these sensitive areas. You know, try not to go off the trail too much. I know that's hard as wildflowerists. You like see something, at least I do, see something in the distance and you want to go find out what it is. But it does, you know, create new trails that drain water away from where they need to be. Um, so yeah, just be careful when you're up there. It's a fragile environment. It's resilient and it's fragile. The final place that I want to take you to is the Gila wilderness and the Gila National Forest. The whole greater Gila eco region is a place that I love to go to in September, kind of when everything else has quieted down, the blooms are fading from the northern mountains, the Gila is just like just getting started. And um, this is the in the Snow Lake Valley, which is on the northern portion of the Gila Wilderness. There's a nice campground there. And every year that I've been here in September, the cow pen daisies, um, the bahia, and a few other varieties of these tiny little yellow sunflowers are just covering the valleys. And it's, you know, it's like a super bloom. Also Dakota mock for vein covers some of these high mesa hill, high mesa grass, grassy areas 
um, you know, you can, you can, I was on a road about a mile away from some of these hills and you could just see purple. It's like California should be attracting people like California does. There's annual sunflowers that line the roads all across the state, but especially in the south, the prickly poppy are out, the Rocky Mountain larkspur are out. The Gila is another place um, like Taos that has really unique diversity of wildflowers, its own species that aren't found elsewhere in the state. Um, the Southern Mountain Paintbrush, Castellasia nelsonii, pretty sure is one of those. It's only, found, you know, it might be up in the north, or I'm sorry, the southwestern area too. Um, the pagoda plant's a fun one in the mint family. So the hike down to Aeroplane Mesa down to um, Middle Fork River, although, you know, from Taos it would take you about eight hours to get to the trailhead, so you want to go there for a weekend, but it's a super easy, you know, just kind of slow decline to the river along a high Mesa mountain, and then you get down below and there are some really um, intact wetlands that have this New Mexico checker mallow. That's a really good sign of a healthy wetland area, undisturbed. Monarch butterflies migrate along the Gila River. They're on a, uh, I, think, I think that's a bull's thistle, but there are Graham's thistle, which are an endangered plant in that same field. Um, there's another super bloom of cow pendaisies. Can't get enough of that. And they share habitat with a lot of fun and unique species. The American Dipper, the only American song, uh, aquatic songbird in the North America. I've seen them all over our mountains up here as well, but this is a fun canyon to find them in. And there's the Gila trout, only found in the streams down in the Gila. I hear they're doing a reintroduction program in the catwalk area. And of course the Mexican gray wolf, which you can, I have heard howling in, at Snow Lake. And, just fun to go look out, try to try to hear them, try to find signs of the Mexican wolves in that area. Um, wildflowers are, well, sorry, wildfires are heavily impacting the Gila and other mountain ranges as well. Um, really hot mega wildflowers have, this is right above the Snow Lake Valley that just took out all the, all the trees in the area. It is uh, threatening some of the endemic species. The white, water, the white water baldy fire back in 2012 burned the entire range of Mogollon death camas, which is a beautiful endemic species to this area. I know Daniela Roth, our state botanist, has been surveying that area and trying to figure out what the impact has been. I haven't seen a report on that yet, but but it all, you know, wildflowers also do open up forests, uh, let sunshine down to the ground, and you know, the nature returns this destruction with beauty often. And you get huge blooms of things like fireweed, ripples penstemon, um, you know, just things that are able to return and bring color and life back to the forest after a wildfire. So yeah, that's coming, kind of coming to the end of the New Mexico wildflower tour. There's so many other beautiful spots, too many to talk about on the Zoom talk, too many to put in a book. Um, so fun to go out and explore and botanize the state. There are wildflower profiles in the book that give a little more information on about 25 different species, some common, some more unique and rare. Um, and I probably don't need to say this to all you guys, but just a reminder to love them and leave them yourself and teach others to do so. Um, I found this little bouquet picked and left on the side of a trail on the way to Spirit Lake, and right in the middle is a really rare wood lily that's on the state endangered list, and I almost cried when I saw that just lying there picked discarded on the ground. So it's super important, I believe, to um, for all of us to learn more than just that wildflowers are colorful and beautiful, but to get to know their names, get to know their habitats, get to know their relationship, so we can care for them and, um, and keep them around. 
And I love this final quote from Robert McFarlane. By noticing and naming, we take the first step into friendship and understanding crossing the gulf between species. And so that's kind of the point of a book like this that does a lot of naming and a little bit of getting to know the species. Um, uh, the book is available on my website or on Amazon. If you order it off my website, I'll send it to you signed. If you don't want it signed, you can leave me a note, but otherwise I'll sign it and send it off to you within a couple of days. And um, yeah. Sorry, Jan, you were breaking up. I don't know if it's my internet or yours, but I couldn't hear what you said. No, I've got bad connection. Okay, I can hear you now. Uh, one of our members ordered it from Amazon while you were talking. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <clears throat> yeah, so there's my website, my email contact if you have any questions. And I also just want to say if you find any errors in the book, I really did. Um, use a lot of resources. I am not the best with the botanical key, but I talked, you know, I, things that I wasn't sure of. I, you, you know, talked to the botanist in New Mexico to try to come up with the most accurate IDs that I could. But if there are mistakes, just email me, let me know. I would really love to know. I'd love to be able to correct those. Um, and, you know, I'd love to hear about your wildflower experiences, your favorite places, what you're seeing. Happy to, happy to chat. You can, also find me on Instagram. I post a lot of wildflower hiking stuff there and on Facebook. Well, thank you, Christina. Can you hear You're me welcome. now? If, yeah. If any, let, me, let me mention a couple things, questions that came in on the chat, uh, some of which were answered. Oh, uh, somebody wanted to know what the thistle was. It was featured in that slide of the butterfly in the Gila. You mentioned the bull thistles were there. And a, and a native thistle yeah, as well, if you know the one that was... The butterfly was on a bull thistle, but there is the okay the, uh, Graham's thistle, which is an endangered one <clears throat> in that same meadow. Right. Um, and let me also mention the other Badlands area you talked about in northwestern New Mexico. I think you were trying to say uh, Angel's Landing. Yeah, Angel Peak. That's yeah. right. <clears throat> yeah, Angel, Angel Peak. That's right. That's right. That's where the Aztec Helio grows. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> right, right. If anybody has a question, either type it in or you, un you can unmute yourself from your menu, either at the top or the bottom of your screen and uh, talk to Christina directly. Christina, this is me. I just wanted to say thank you. I really enjoyed your slideshow. I'm the member that ordered the book. Because I can't, wait. I can't wait to go on those hikes. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. I'm glad you liked it. And, and uh, let me know what you see out there. I will. It was nice seeing everybody, but I got to go. OK. Thank you. Uh, great. One, uh, one, great. Uh, one comment, Christina. I noticed that the Whipple's Pinstemon you pictured was a light blue. And the ones I've seen, uh, here in New Mexico and in Colorado, we're almost, a, they're such dark purple, they're almost black. So that yeah. color can really vary. Yeah, absolutely. And some of that was the lighting it was in and the way that photo was exposed. But that, that, that one, that picture was taken in the Sacramento mountains. And um, uh, yeah, there were color variations from like super dusky purple to a lighter. Yeah, a dusky pinstemon is actually one of the common names of it, the dusky pinstemon. And yeah, let's see, another question came in, where's the hoodoo bill? That was in the Lybrook Badlands, right? Yeah, it is in the Lybrook Badlands. And it's, um, you'll, have to, you'll have to direct message me so I can give you the best directions and a, and a GPS point because it's not on, on marked roads. It's fairly easy to get to, but they're just gas and oil roads and they're not marked, so. So it's off of Highway 550. Uh, it's off of Highway past, 550. Way past Cuba. You take the road to Chaco Canyon and after a couple miles, you're gonna turn into the Badlands and then it's another couple side roads in there. Yeah. Really, really great place. Highly recommend going checking it out too. 
Uh, I will add that I uh, remember, I don't think, is Mary on? Mary Adams may be on. She was hiking Aguasaca this weekend and she sent me a list of 36 species she identified as shrubs and flowers. Well, wonderful. Uh, some of which, Mary, are you on? I'm on. Okay. Yeah, that was uh, pretty amazing. And it was very different. There were not many that overlapped with the flowers, the list I'd made from July and August hikes. Right, they're very different. I've hiked it in July a couple of times and the early flowers are very, very different than I've ever seen there before. 